Buddy Crafting Journey here, that journey chick on Instagram. Welcome to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of my subscribers. You don't know how much I really deeply, deeply appreciate you guys showing up every day and watching the show. And I'm glad that you're enjoying it. And it, let me just say, if you're not enjoying it, don't watch. Really, I don't force anybody to watch. So I got a green pen for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, today, the like button will be entertaining my granddaughter. She's here on spring break, but I have to go to work. Gotta go to work, 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 work. But my sister's here with her too. So the like button and my sister will be watching her. Don't forget to hit the like button on your way in or out today. And if you enjoy the content of the channel and you're still here, I haven't scared you off, please hit the, uh, consider subscribing, hit the like button. And if you're already a subscriber, consider becoming a member of the channel. Um, your monthly donations go to support the content of the channel. And don't forget the notification bell because you never know when I'm going to go live. Now, yesterday... I did not go live. I was prepared to go live. I was sitting here. I was diamond painting. And I made the mistake Saturday night of enjoying a milkshake. So Sunday morning, I was paying for it. Now, we're not going to go into any details because it's kind of gross. But every five minutes, yeah. So I just couldn't go live. I do apologize. I had a nice show planned for you guys, but we'll do it next week. Anyway, got the planner out. I got a good show planned for you today. Got the planner out. I have decorated for St. Patrick's Day. I got little... Um, Four leaf clovers. I got a little diamond here. Just, you know, it's not it's supposed to be a pot of gold, but yeah. I got St. Patrick's Day. This one says, looking for a little thing called luck. Yes. Top of the morning. And this one says, somewhere over the rainbow. So tomorrow, Tuesday the 15th, at 10.45, I have a CT scan of my knee. They have to do this because they use a robotic instrument during the, their surgery called the Mako, and the, it has something to do with the CT scan, and it, I don't know, I, they take the results from the CT scan, and they input that into the robot, and uh, yeah, I don't get it, just... Just wake me up when it's over. Um, surgery schedule for the 28th. So I've got two weeks from today. So there's our green pen. Let's put that away. Or else I will lose it. So guess what you don't see in front of you today? Yeah. Yes. The Eiffel Tower painting. <laughs> I finished it. I'll put a picture here of what it looks like finished and I was never so glad to get something finished that thing was so big now the one that I have out now is just a little smaller 70 by 84 but it's the black lab dog and that's here I haven't prepared the I got it on the light pad turn it off I haven't prepared the canvas yet but this is what it's going to look like I'll put a up close picture there as well here's all the drills Lots of, uh, this. Uh, you might recall, this is the black lab that has the landscape painting inside of it. So I am still doing the year of landscapes. It's a landscape, but it's called Black Labrador. And then all around it is color blocking in these three different color whites. That's why you see all these whites here. There's like tons of bags of 3865. Yeah, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, 11 bags and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bags of I don't know what color that is. Yeah, another color white, like an egg crew. And when I prepare my canvas, I do like to use, I'll take the plastic off and I will use these release papers that you can get on Amazon. So I'll do a video on all of that later. But for now, um, I want to talk about National Children's Craft Day. And I didn't write it in the planner. I should have. Um, today is National Children's Craft Day. This apparently March is National Crafters Month. This is our month, guys. So 
Today's the day to get your children involved in crafts. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. You know what I like? Nareta's granddaughter, uh, she bought her those. Do you remember when we were little, we made those little pot holders with the bands? They still have those and kids love them. So you could do that. You could bake with them. I mean, that's a craft. You could uh, teach them how to do some photography. Um, you know, just see where their mind goes. It, I, you know, it's just such um, a wonderful feeling to enjoy watching a child learn something. It teaches them discipline. It teaches them how to follow instructions. Um, it teaches them what happens when they fail. Um, yeah, a lot of things. So get your kids involved in crafts. Now, if you want to get them involved in diamond painting, there's a lot of really small, like Diamond Dots has a lot of, uh, a pretty good selection of small crafts, like little bracelets, keychains, things that they can start out really small with. Um, I remember when I got Malia involved in, she didn't stick to it, but when I first got her involved, she was doing little bracelets, but she was making her own design. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm making my own design. And she did a great job of it. She didn't like the design that came on the bracelet, so she made her own. <laughs> I thought it was really crafty, don't you think? <laughs> so today is National Children's Craft Day. I need some coffee. My sister says, you talk a hundred miles an hour. Um, that's because I got to go to work, I guess. I don't know. I guess I should slow it down. So let's talk about crafting and crime daily. Yeah, so uh, there was no fentanyl trial on Friday. Friday, they took the day off, no court on Friday. I didn't know what to watch. I was at, t at work and I couldn't find anything interesting to watch. I'm like, where's the trial? So no trial. But I researched a story that I'm going to tell you about. Olivia Gant was born prematurely on June 21st, 2010 in Pasadena, Texas to her mother, Kelly Renee Turner, and her father, Jeffrey Gant. She lived at home with her siblings, <clears throat> Samantha and Anna. Everything was going fine with Olivia. She seemed to be progressing normally until her nine-month checkup. Now, her mother, Kelly Renee Turner, kept a blog. And I want to read to you what she wrote on her blog. Um, Friday, December 12th, 2014. Olivia was born premature and was other than little healthy, or so we thought. At around nine month checkup, her pediatrician noticed that she was not developing mentally, physically, and that her head was growing off the chart. After a trip to the orthotics place and a referral to the neurologist, we thought we would simply get a helmet to reshape her skull and all would be well. Don't ever count your chickens before they're hatched. MRI of the brain at the neuro office showed that Olivia had a vascular malformation of the brain. Further testing determined that it is inoperable. What came with that possibility of seizures, blindness, aneurysm, stroke, or death, it was decided that she would be monitored every few months. Routine MRI, not. The next MRI led them to do an ultrasound because something in her neck looked different. So we now discovered that there is a tumor on the parotid gland in her neck. What comes with that, you may wonder. Deafness in the right ear, trouble swallowing, trouble chewing. So in the course of from the time Olivia began seeing doctor for specific things in her short life, we have now turned to in June, have extended our diagnosis list, have been to several doctors before we found one actually able to test and treat Olivia, and we found them in Denver, Colorado. So this goes on for a little while, but while she was in Texas, Kelly Renee Turner joined this church. 
She would she accepted the kindness of the church. She would tell them everything that was going on with her daughter. They would sympathize with her, empathize with her. Here, come sit by me at church. They would uh, raise money through bake sales. There was one group of ladies that had a Sunday school class. Um, elderly ladies, they're all on you know Medicare, but they made they put together money and they donated it to her. So they raised enough money for Olivia to have a dog, a, an epilepsy dog. They named the dog Hero, and this dog would allow Olivia's mother time to rest. So Olivia's mother was so thrilled at getting this therapy dog because she said it allowed her to free up time so she wouldn't have to check on her daughter every five minutes thinking, oh my God, she's going to have a seizure. So she now had this therapy dog that was trained to alert when the child had seizures. So this allowed her to cook for her family, get some rest. So she was just thrilled about this dog named Hero. Meanwhile, you know, medical bills were stacking up. The church people were trying to help with these medical bills. But the father, Jeffrey Gant, he's like, I've got insurance. And she's like, no, 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 we're not going to use your insurance. I've got a different way. So she was using Medicaid. Meanwhile, Kelly and Jeff's other daughter, Samantha, was suffering reportedly from osteomyelitis, um, which led to an immune disease and later on, cancer. Um, because she was suffering from this immune disease, no one really saw her out much because she was kept very isolated so she wouldn't get infections. So about this time, Olivia's turning two years old. The mother takes her two daughters, uh, Samantha and Olivia, and moves them to Denver, Colorado. She says, I have enrolled them in a special program where they're going to get specialized care. It's Pearl. Um, and so she moved them to Denver, Colorado. And she left behind her daughter, Anna, and she left behind her husband. But her husband dutifully sent $900 a week to Kelly for support of her daughter. She told her friends, she told her church friends, hey, we're going to go see this world-renowned program for specialized care for my daughters, even though there were world-renowned programs in Texas. She just bypassed them and decided she's going to go to Colorado. So once in Colorado, Olivia was treated for constipation. She had some hard stool in her bowel and they took it out and sent her home. But her mother kept bringing her back saying, you know, she's not eating well. She's, she's not digesting her food. She's not eating. You know, she's having a hard time chewing. Um, over the next five years, Olivia would come back to that hospital over one thousand times, either for a visit or an admission. She had over 25 medical procedures, including an ileostomy. Now, if she was four years old when she had the ileostomy. Now, let me tell you what an ileostomy is. This is where they take part of your bowel and they reroute it through a hole in the abdomen into a bag. So this four-year-old had stool draining into a bag four years old is how horrible um, because her colon needed to rest they thought during this time she also had three different kinds of feeding tubes she was started on anti-seizure medication even though no one ever witnessed her having a seizure no doctor ever saw it no family member ever saw it um, but the mother was able to talk the doctor into the medication being necessary Around this time, she was also put on heavy doses of narcotics, and the mother was telling all of her friends, including the church people back in Texas who were still sending her money, my daughter is terminally ill. She also told her church friends, you know, after she got to Colorado, ah, the dog died, Hero died. What? <laughs> yeah, the dog had died. Interesting, huh? <laughs> So after telling everyone that her daughter was terminally ill, she created a bucket list for her daughter. Now, this bucket list included having a Batman slash 
Disney princess party. She wanted to combine them. Um, she wanted to be a fireman for a day. She wanted to be a police officer. So the Denver, Colorado Police Department made her this little cute little outfit. I'll put a picture here if I can find it. A little police outfit and they staged a crime that she could help solve. And so she went on a ride along with the police officer. She got to, you know, do the siren. And when they uh, apprehended the bad guy, she got to put him in handcuffs. Then she goes back to the police station and the police chief gives her a little badge. And um, he says, you're going to be the police chief for the day. I mean, how sweet. Olivia must have been over the moon about this. Then she got to spend the day with the fire department. They gave her like a little one of those fire department coats and a little fire hat. She got to ride in the truck and they took her to the training, the training grounds. She didn't know this, but um, they staged a dumpster fire and she got to help put out the fire. She had a wonderful day. And the Make-A-Wish Foundation spent $11,000 putting on this Batman Disney princess birthday party. Um, yeah, so she had all these things coming in, all this charity, GoFundMes, all of the stuff was coming in, not to mention the Medicaid money, paying all these bills. So when Olivia was five years old, her mother uh, was sent to Boston to get a second opinion. The doctor in Boston, after examining this child, said this ileostomy should be reversed and she should be taken off all narcotics. They sent that report to the Children's Hospital of Colorado, and we don't know what happened with it. Yeah. Now... In March of 2017, the mother was caught changing the ileostomy bag. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, but it's kind of creepy. Why is she messing around with the bag? So, so the hospital, the nurses and the doctors, they were starting to have suspicions that this mother was causing the illnesses. So they were reporting it internally to their child protection team. And the child protection team was, I don't know what they were doing about it, but they were never calling any outside agencies. No, no social services, no child protective services, no police. No one ever got called. Now, I got to tell you, as nurses and doctors, we are mandatory reporters. You cannot if you can report it internally if you want that's fine but you you are mandated by law to report it to an outside agency you know any suspicions you have that a child is being neglected or abused you have to report it they did not so and the child protective team that was at the hospital never did anything so when they caught this mother messing around with the bag what they decided to do was we're going to put a sitter in the room anytime this mother is in the room we're going to have a sitter in there and what I, do you remember my sitter tales from about a month ago this is a person who's medically trained um who volunteers to sit in the room and just watch the child and make sure nothing happens between the mother and the child. Um, and lo and behold, Olivia started improving. Her condition started improving. An occupational therapist tested her for speech she uh, and, and eating and swallowing and actually got the child to a point where she was eating age-appropriate food and tolerating it. So... It, this was about March of 2017, so about three weeks after this uh, incident where they see this mother changing the bag, um, they put in the sitter. The mother requests that her daughter, who she believes to be terminally ill, be made a do-not-resuscitate patient. So when a family member requests that on a terminally ill patient, you cannot say no if the patient is truly terminally ill. So this, there was a Dr. Williams involved. And he did not believe that Olivia was terminally ill. So he refused to sign this do not resuscitate order. It's an order that has to be signed by the physician. It's requested by the family and it's signed by the physician. And when once it's in place, if anything were to happen to Olivia, if her heart were to stop or she were to stop breathing, they would just have to let her go. You, can, you could not resuscitate her once the order was signed. He wouldn't sign the order, this Dr. Williams. So he takes it to the ethics committee of the hospital and says to the ethics committee, I don't think there's anything wrong with this child. I don't believe there's anything wrong with her. And I am not going to sign this do not resuscitate order. Well, the ethics committee, after 
consulting amongst each other, sided with the mother. They took Dr. Williams off the case and put another doctor on the case. Now the mother talked to the other doctor and said, hey, my daughter's terminally ill. Will you sign the do not resuscitate order? He signs it. Yeah. You know, all they had to, all they knew was what the mother was telling them. They had the history from the mother. And from what I understand, doctors do not take the time to sit and read medical records from, you know, past medical records. It would be, it would take an exorbitant amount of time. So the history that a parent provides is pretty doggone important and they need to be able to rely on it. So this doctor relying on the mother's history, she's terminally ill, signs the do not resuscitate order. She takes her daughter out of the hospital and rolls her, enrolls her in hospice. There was one particular hospice nurse who suspected something was going on. Again, she did not report it, but she talked the mother into leaving for a 36-hour period, during which time she was feeding Olivia, and Olivia was eating normally. But when the mother was there, she was just getting popsicle juice, and that was it. She was starving her daughter to death. And on August 20th, 2017, Olivia passed away in hospice. Her cause of death was listed as intestinal failure as a complication of multiple medical issues. And Olivia's headstone read, always be joyful. Very sad. So a year goes by and Kelly Renee Turner brings her other daughter, Samantha, to Children's Hospital, Colorado. Now, by now, Samantha is 11 years old, and she tells the, the doctors at Children's Hospital, Colorado, that her daughter has bone pain, that she has this history of cancer. So they're like, oh, okay, well, where was she treated? Well, here. Um, so they go to look for the records, and they can't find them. So she says, well, she was also treated back in Texas. So they ask for the hospital in Texas for the records. No treatment ever in Texas. So now they're remembering her. They're like, hey, there's something's going on here. I remember her for when she used to bring in Olivia with all these medical problems. And now she's bringing in Samantha with medical problems we can't substantiate. So they got the police involved. Yay! Okay. So the police began their investigation, and in 2018, they exhumed Olivia's body, which I think you guys know means they dug her up. Uh, they dug her up and did an autopsy. The medical examiner could not substantiate any of the medical illnesses that the mother claimed that she had. So the police found Kelly Renee Turner in a local hotel and arrested her on charges of multiple felonies, including first-degree murder and Medicaid fraud. Now, interestingly enough, it was Kelly Renee Turner who actually was the first person to mention Munchausen's by proxy. And that's what this is. Do you guys remember when I covered the case of Gypsy Rose Blanchard? Her mother had faked all of these illnesses that she had, and then she got to be 17, 18, 19 years old and realized, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. Her mother was making her ill to get attention, which is what the police believe was going on here, that this was Munchausen's by proxy, that the mother was doing all these because she was getting sympathy from the church members. She got, she was getting monetary gain. She was, uh, had got over half a million dollars for Medicare, an $11,000 birthday party for her child. And then every time she took her daughter to the hospital, you know, nurses would sympathize with her and they'd hug her and, oh, your child's terminally ill. And, you know, so she was doing all this to get attention. So during that year after Olivia died, she didn't get any attention or narcotics, I should say. And so she decided to bring her other daughter in. So anyway, um, Kelly Renee Turner is sitting in jail. She was waiting for trial. The trial was scheduled for February of 2022, last month. So in January of 2022, uh, 
Kelly Renee Turner decided to plead guilty. She changed her plea to guilty in exchange for a 16-year sentence. So she is serving a 16-year sentence, three or four years of which she has already served. Meanwhile, Samantha is living with her grandfather and is perfectly healthy. The other daughter, Anna, who was older, is attending college in Boston. I just hope that Kelly Renee Turner is getting treatment for Munchausen's by proxy because this is a mental diagnosis. This is not a healthy mental woman. Um, this, What she did to that child, yeah, was it criminal? Yes, but it was also uh, mentally unhealthy, very mentally unhealthy. So that's my story for today, the story of Olivia Gant. Yeah, may she rest in peace. Poor little girl. She was a sweet, sweet little girl. Anyway, what are we doing this day in history? On March 14th, 1964, Jack Ruby is sentenced to death for the murder of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, as you recall, Lee Harvey Oswald is the person that shot JFK in the grassy knoll. Well, they were transferring Lee Harvey Oswald through the basement of the police station to a more secure facility. And there was a group of reporters surrounding him and um, all the press. And Jack Ruby, who was like this casino owner, just walks through the crowd, goes up to him and shoots him and kills him. So Jack Ruby is sentenced he was a, a Dallas nightclub owner. He's found guilty of murder with malice, and he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. Now, this was the first time a courtroom verdict was ever aired on television. Today, we take this for granted, and I cover these trials all the time where people are found guilty of murder and they're sentenced on television. Well, this was the first time anyone had ever been sentenced on television, Jack Ruby. And that's what happened this day in history. He sentenced to die in the electric chair. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, I hope you have a fabulous Monday and a fabulous week and that you stay tuned tomorrow for the next edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. Tomorrow, uh, or today, the trial will continue uh, in the fentanyl murder case with Dr. William Husel. Um, I don't know if the prosecution has any more witnesses um, and I don't know if the defendant is going to take the stand. We're going to find all of that out today, and I will bring that to you tomorrow. Have a wonderful Monday, and I will see you on the flip side. Mm -hmm.